Did you know that the number of people living in Democratic states has fallen by more than half since 2003? I have to admit, I did not. But I learned that statistic in Alan Gelzo's new book, Our Ancient Faith, Lincoln, Democracy, and the American Experiment. Gelzo writes to renew democracy in what he calls, quote, a time of shadows by exploring the life and thinking of America's greatest president, Abraham Lincoln. Alan Gelzo is the Thomas W. Smith Distinguished Research Scholar in the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University, where he teaches courses on Lincoln, the Civil War era Constitution, and American intellectual history. If you know Dr. Gelzo, then you've almost certainly encountered his previous works on the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln faced down the greatest threat to democracy in American history, at least so far. And Gelzo sees democracy threatened today by income inequality, cultural polarization, and bureaucracy that is substituted for representative legislation. I'm most interested, though, in the relationship between democracy and culture. Dr. Gelzo writes this, quote, You can have a democracy without the underpinnings of culture but you will probably not have it very long. And even while you have it, it will be disappointing in its results. Now, we know as Christians that our beliefs provided those cultural underpinnings in many ways, and it's no surprise that as church affiliation has declined, so has confidence in our political system. Let me turn again to quote Dr. Gelzo. It is the collapse of shared mores, which has emerged in American minds as the single biggest danger to liberal democracy, For without any underlying set of agreed assumptions, no majority can rule safely and no minority can sleep quietly. Now that is a line that will keep you up at night. Now Dr. Gelza joins me now on Gospel Bound to discuss what makes our time unique, why national conservatives are the mirror image of progressives, how to understand Lincoln's complicated views on race and the Bible, and more. Dr. Gelza, thank you for joining me. Colin, very nice to be here with you. Uh, Dr. Gelzo, you're, you're a historian. What is unique, or at least particular, about our time? I mentioned earlier that y- you said we live in a time of shadows. What do you mean? We live in a time that is pervaded by a sense of anxiety, a sense of crisis about democracy. And some of that is because we've actually sustained something of a fall. And by that I mean... It doesn't take very much to reflect back only a few decades to what seemed like an era of triumph for democracy. The Soviet Union went to pieces. The Berlin Wall came down. It, It appeared as though democracy really had finally at last established itself as the default position for human societies. And there were going to be a few exceptions, but... The assumption was those exceptions themselves would gradually yield. We had we had gotten over the big threat, and now simply democracy, that was going to be the way things were going to move. That at least is what it seemed like, let's say in the mid-1990s. And then, then it all fell apart. It fell apart through the Great Recession of 2008. It fell apart through the rise of China to major influence, both politically and economically in the world. Above all, it was a victim of the resurgence of various kinds of authoritarianism, especially uh, manifest by movements like Al-Qaeda, and then, of course, the attack on the World Trade Center and elsewhere in the United States on 9-11. And after that, people looked around and said, are we really certain that this thing we call democracy really has both feet on the ground. It looks like it's taken some terrible, terrible shots to the jaw. Is it really as stable as we think? As we reflected on that, we also had to deal within ourselves because we moved into a dramatic new environment of security and surveillance after 9-11. Some of us looked at that and panicked at it. We were afraid of the creation of a national surveillance state. Others of us said, well, this will be temporary, and in fact, we need to do this right now simply for security. In fact, it hasn't turned out to be temporary. And what's even worse, 
it has now been doubled down by the pervasiveness of the internet and by social media platforms for increasing that kind of surveillance, even in the most informal ways. So we now are struggling with this sense that maybe democracy is not the inevitable future. And in simply the last few years, the kind of political polarization that has taken hold of American imaginations has made us wonder. I've heard it more times than I really like to hear the question, are we headed ourselves for some kind of new civil war? The very fact that we would ask that question, given the terrible costs of what happened in 1861 to 65, the, the fact that we would ask that question, that we would be afraid of that question, and that some people would be willing to contemplate that question, that in itself is destabilizing. And it's in that environment that you look around and you say, where can we find some guidance? Where can we find some historical examples that are relevant to the American experience? Is there something in our past? That's why I have pointed to the figure of Abraham Lincoln. Because Lincoln, of course, presided over a time of enormous polarization, of a lack of confidence in democracy, of hostility to democracy by great powers abroad. Everything seemed to be conspiring in the direction of pulling down the edifice of a democratic republic that had been created in 1776. And what made it worse, what even more agonizing, was that there were forces at hand within American life that would aid and abet that. Lincoln stands at the helm of the ship of state as it enters this period of crisis. He navigates us skillfully and well and successfully through the storm. And knowing that, that's why I pose these questions. What did Lincoln think democracy was? What can we learn from Lincoln? How can we reclaim our sense of who and what we are as Americans? Can Lincoln help us that way? It seems that in those 25, 30 years that you've described there since the, quote, end of history, the people discussed with the triumph of democracy, we've also seen a pretty significant shift away from civics education, history education, the liberal arts in general, um, in part because of the polarization and politicization of those liberal arts and of those fields. Um, so one of the things I appreciate about this book is you're continuing to provide any number of historical lessons. You're also providing civics lessons. Yes, yes. The, the title of the book is, in a way, a kind of uh, heading for a civics lesson. I called it our ancient faith because it's a phrase that Lincoln used in the great speech he gives in October of 1854 in Peoria, speech which really contains his whole political philosophy. And in it, he spoke about the American experiment in a democratic republic as being guided by the principles of the Declaration of Independence. And those principles, he said, form our ancient faith. He casts it in almost religious terms. And what he's suggesting, first of all, is that this faith has the power of a faith to transform. But secondly, it is ancient. All right, it only goes back to 1776. But all right, it has lasted even as long as it has to 1854. That no one could easily have expected. And then thirdly, it is, it is a faith that Americans can lay hands on and embrace, politically speaking, so that it becomes what Lincoln, in another earlier speech, called a kind of civic religion. I think I know your catalog well enough to state this, but you can correct me. <laughs> but we, the, the fact that we see the Declaration of Independence as the kind of founding document of the United States that it is, is largely owing to Lincoln. Is that correct? I think that there's something that can be said for that, because Lincoln insisted as many times as he could get people to listen to him, that his starting point politically was the Declaration of Independence. He cites the Declaration over and over again, especially through the great contest that he has with Stephen A. Douglas in Illinois for the Illinois Senate seat in 1858. At the start of that campaign, Colin, he gives a marvelous speech in which he says, Look, look at Americans today. Fully half of Americans today 
either came from some other place, Scandinavia, Germany, France, he says, or else are the children of those he did. In other words, they don't have a direct lineage to the American Revolution. They're, they're not sons and daughters of the American Revolution. If they don't have that kind of direct, tangible contact with the principles and the experience of the revolution, what, where, where are they going to derive any guidance from? Oh, says Lincoln, here, I will tell you where they will get guidance. They will read the Declaration, and they will read in it these words, all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And Lincoln says, when people, no matter where they've come from or when they've come from, when they read the words of that declaration, then they feel that they are bone of the bone and flesh of the flesh of those old men that wrote the declaration, and so they are. That is, he said, the electric cord that runs through every lover of liberty everywhere. He can appeal to the Declaration because the Declaration itself lays out universals and fundamentals drawn directly from natural law, the law that is instilled and hardwired into every one of us by our Creator. When he's, what, three years later, on his road to his inauguration as president, he stops in Philadelphia speaks twice at Independence Hall, inside and outside, and he says, I have never had a feeling politically that was not drawn from the Declaration of Independence. And of course, it's the declaration that at Gettysburg, he will once again invoke when he asks us to remember that four score and seven years ago, 1776, our fathers brought forth this country dedicated to a proposition that all men are created equal. Once again, he's invoking the Declaration of Independence. That becomes the touchstone to which he returns time and time again. And endowed by their creator, of exactly. course. Exactly. And explain more of where Lincoln derived his sense for natural law. Lincoln is a lawyer to start with. He practices law for 24 years, and he's... <laughs> He's quite a good lawyer at it, too. He's a trial lawyer. Uh, he's not a wills and estates man, doesn't sit and move papers from one pile to the other on his desk. No, he's, he's out on the circuit. He's out on the circuit communicating with people in a very ordinary way. He has to persuade them. He has to stand in front of a jury and convince them. And he gets very good at that. Why? He learns how to speak to what principles and ideas are common to everyone. So that when people hear him, they don't hear someone speaking in abstractions, but they also don't hear someone speaking in, in legal irrelevancies either. They, they hear someone who wants to appeal to their fundamental senses of things. So he starts out with that understanding that in order to get decisions, he's got to be able to appeal to what people understand together and in common. The other root of that is the confrontation with slavery. Because slavery pretended to appeal to a right, the right of property. So owning property had, from the days of John Locke and the two treatises on government, been understood to be one of those natural rights. Well, if you could transfer the definition of owning property to a point where it would include owning human beings, you could hide behind that. You could claim that you were doing the right thing. Lincoln says, no, you can't do that because everybody knows that trying to claim human beings as property is in fact itself a violation of any kind of natural claim to property. And here's the proof of it. The proof of it is that even an ant, he writes this in a memorandum that it will be part of the whole campaign he has to wage this way. Even the ant, it's like, it's like the Proverbs, go to thou sluggard and consider the ant. Well, he asks you, consider the ant. The ant will drag a crumb of bread to its nest, and it will furiously fight off the attempt of any other to try and take that crumb from him. He says, even an ant knows, it knows automatically, knows naturally that that's a violation. And even, even, even the, uh, the, the least imaginative slave knows that he's being wronged when the fruit of his labor is taken from him 
and given to someone else. So he appeals to natural law because he has to. He has to appeal away from the kind of reasoning that Stephen Douglas used, which was to say, look, if 51% of the people in a territory or a state want to legalize slavery, that's okay. All that matters is majoritarianism. Lincoln says, no, majorities are right. Majorities are part of the warp and woof of democracy. Majorities don't determine everything, though. There is a circle within which there are certain things which cannot be compromised. There are certain things that you don't establish by taking a vote. And among those things are those natural rights within that circle that Jefferson articulates in the Declaration and which represent the fundamental operation of natural law in human life. So many different directions that we could go from that from that amazing answer. Let's go back to talk about majority rule. Um, this, I think, is one of the most common civics misunderstandings in, in American democracy. We live in a democracy, but we do not live by majority rule. And you write, quote, it is the abiding weakness of democracies to assume that a majority must, simply by the way of being a majority, be right and good, and therefore have a license to rule. And second to that is the resentment of minorities who believe that the majority is neither right nor good and is therefore illegitimate. Many examples we could cite from history. Let's look at it positively. What are some historical examples where you think this balance has been struck well? I look over the decades of American life, and I see many points at which great issues had to be decided by being put to votes. And usually it comes indirectly. We don't have direct referendums on issues. Rather, we have moments of confrontation through the electoral process, through electing presidents, through electing members of Congress, through electing governors, through electing members of state legislatures, even, even, even electing members of school boards. It is in those indirect ways that majorities establish. This is what the people decide they want to do. Because fundamentally in a democracy, it is the people who rule. And the, the, the very gist of democracy is that sovereignty resides in the people. So the people decide this, and they decide these issues in our system, a republic, indirectly through their representatives. Sometimes we have made some serious mistakes. Sometimes legislatures have passed legislation, I think of the Alien and Sedition Acts under mm-hmm. President Adams, mm-hmm. which we look back on and we, we, we strike our heads and say, what were they thinking? Because at the moment you can be carried away by fear, you can be carried away by passion, and yet there has always been a certain resiliency, a certain flexibility, which allows us, after a bit, to step back and say, Is that really a good idea? Perhaps we should listen to some other voices. And here's where the interplay of majorities and minorities comes into into place. There is never going to be a democracy where everybody agrees on everything. There's never going to be unanimity. And 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 Lincoln says this in one of his early speeches as president. If you're expecting in a democracy to get unanimous support for one thing or another thing, you're, you're, you're never going to get it. It's not going to happen. What you will get will be majorities and what you'll get will be minorities. Now, in a democracy, a majority has the right to rule, has the right to move forward with its agenda and its decisions. But while it has that authority, what it doesn't have is the authority to take the minority, put it up against a barn wall and shoot it. All right. All right. So what a majority gets is legitimacy. That is not the same thing as power. Hmm. See, power is what leads to murder. Legitimacy is what leads to rule. Very different quantities. Now, that's the rule concerning majorities. What about minorities? Minorities in a democracy have the right to dissent. They can say, no, we disagree. We think this is wrong. The majority may think we want to go in this particular direction, but we don't believe it's going to end well. They have the right to dissent. What they don't have is the right to subvert. They don't have the right to obstruct. 
They do not have the power. Again, that question of power. They don't have the power to, ma- to destroy the direction that a sovereign people wants to move in. They can testify against it. They can dissent from it. But at the end of the day, they cannot destroy it because that would destroy democracy itself. If, in fact, the minority is right in its dissent, then we have the confidence that given natural law, people will understand eventually the direction in which things really do need to move, and they will change that way. Have we done that in the past? We've done that multiple times in the past. We've, we've done some foolish things. We've made mistakes. Are we surprised at that? We don't, we, we don't skate easily over the ice any more than anyone else does. But what has been manifest over and over again is the realization, no, this, this, this particular decision that was made at a point in the past is wrong. Now we're going to go in the other direction. And we've seen that not only in very long distance terms to things like the response to the Alien and Sedition Act, but we also see it in terms of the nullification crisis. We see it in decisions about the Kansas-Nebraska bill that so infuriated and motivated Lincoln in 1854. And we've seen it even in, in recent times, in our own lifetimes, from, let us say, the Vietnam War all the way up to the most recent Supreme Court decisions. A democracy is always in movement. Democracy is always trying to discover, how can we do this better? How can we do this right? In authoritarian regimes, there's never a question. Because in an authoritarian regime, first of all, you govern by power. Right. The second thing is power makes stupid. <laughs> because, of course, someone who has power, if they're about to do a stupid thing, who is going to be brave enough to tell them that? You object and off goes your head. Well, let me, oh. let me interject something there and then keep going on that thought. It's one reason that democracies tend to be successful in military yeah. um, endeavors, because yeah. they tend the the authoritarian regimes see them as soft, see them as weak, see them as divided you know, with all these different kinds of dissent, and they tend to it takes a little while to get going, but over time power makes stupid, and stupid makes bad military decisions. But democracies can course correct. Herman Goering said that Americans were good at making refrigerators and razor blades. Yeah, right. yeah, well, he learned the hard way, didn't he? <laughs> and he, and in the history of, of, of the American Republic, he has not been the only one. I, I was talking to my wife a few minutes ago, and I was saying, you look, you look at this event called the American Civil War. Who are the people it calls to the forefront? Well, for one thing, it calls Abraham Lincoln. Who, who would have guessed? Who would have guessed this <laughs> lawyer Someone dismissed him, this, this county court lawyer from central Illinois. When he, was, when he was nominated and then elected in November of 1860, one Illinois editor said, who will write this ignorant man's state papers for him? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's not only Lincoln. Look at some of the other people that, that, that the war presents us with. Ulysses Grant. Grant, yeah. You know, in... <clears throat> We were talking about visiting Appomattox, and I said one of the great moments at Appomattox, it's a moment of great sorrow, of great loss, but it's also a moment that can really be sublime because Grant, after exchanging the surrender term letters, Lee, of course, leaves, gets on his horse. Grant steps out on the porch of the McLean house, takes off his hat to salute Lee, and Lee returns the salute, and they ride off. In the distance... In the distance, you begin to hear artillery fire. Grant stomps and asks, what, what is that? And his staff explains to him, well, those are our artillery batteries. They're celebrating the, the surrender. Grant says, tell them to stop. The rebels are our countrymen again. Yeah. You think, now there, there is an extraordinary man. Four years before that, Colin, almost to the day, he had been clerking in his father's leather goods store, a failure at everything he had tried. So much of a, so much a failure that he actually pawned his watch to buy Christmas presents for his children. And then four years later, there he is at Appomattox. Four years after that, he is president of the United States. 
If Lincoln's story is an extraordinary American story, how much less Ulysses Grant? And then you go on from there. You, do, you talk about someone like William Tecumseh Sherman, this this man who who talked like a fire hose, who with this this grisly reddish beard and the, and the incessant cigar smoking, um, just a man who exuded nervous energy all the time. When the mayor of Atlanta wrote to him to protest the bombardment of Atlanta, Sherman responded, "The only thing you have to do." to make this bombardment stop is to return to the national authority. <laughs> and, and if you will do that, I will share my last cracker with you. These are the, these are the men whom the exigencies of the civil war cast up for us. Some of them, I think, had it not been for the war, we would never have heard from. Yeah. And yet, here in this war, when everyone assumed at the beginning, or almost everyone assumed at the beginning, especially in Europe, that the American Republic is obviously going to blow itself up now. Suddenly, in this American democracy, look what steps forward. Lincoln, Grant, Sherman. It is simply extraordinary. The depth, the resources, the resiliency of democracy. Totalitarianisms, authoritarian governments always look so strong, so powerful. They have the, their great parades and their strutting, goose-stepping soldiers and missiles on truck beds. And they look powerful and they sound powerful, but they're really fragile. Put the slightest pressure on them. They fail. They collapse. Whereas a democracy, it gets knocked down right at the beginning of, of, of round one. It's just like Rocky Balboa. <laughs> he gets up again. He fights. And this is what democracy does. Because it has an inner strength and an inner resiliency that these other regimes simply do not have. I have a feeling you just answered this question, but um, I thought maybe I'd wait to to do all the Civil War discussion till the end. But let's let's go there now, and we can return to some of the other themes. Um, my son is going to be—he's in third grade. He's going to be dressing up as Ulysses Grant for school. That's the biography he's going to—he's going to be doing. Is he going to get the beard, huh? <laughs> we'll figure that out. We've—we've—we've we've, we've selected which kind of hat, of course, um, that, right. that we're going to wear. And you know, we don't have to go all out for the for the coat, of course, because he wore the old, famously at Appomattox, the old yeah. worn down uh, worn out coat. Uh, in contrast to Lee, um, I've been—I've been fascinated with the Civil War since I think I. I think I was three. My first memory, um, which is crazy to imagine, my my first dream was related to the Civil War, probably around age three. I, I can't remember how many times I've been to Gettysburg. I think, um, including then taking my son uh, a number of times. I I think you've alluded to this because certainly it's one of the reasons I gravitate toward your work on that period, including this book. Um, what is so captivating to you? about that period. Um, I think what, what, again, what I've learned from you is a lot of what you just said right there. That's part of what captivates me about that period. But how would you expand on that? There are, there are a number of things that I could cite. And, and truth be told, I got bitten by the bug almost as, as early as you. <laughs> uh, I, I think, I think it has a, I think it has a certain valence for, for young ages. Yeah. And, and the, the enduring, significance of it just never seems to lose its oomph. The story just just never seems to wear out because there's so many parts to it. I think in the largest sense, the Civil War is compelling for us because first of all, it has such extraordinary characters. And I've mentioned just some of them already. A few of them, yeah. Characters you, just, you could not have predicted would, would come to the surface of public life. Then there is the struggle, the contest itself, and the agony of all the suffering that was inflicted by the war. You walk around, as I've often done, at the Soldiers' National Cemetery at Gettysburg, and you, you look at these semicircular rows of graves. Colin, fully a third of them are unknown. Wow. We have no idea who they were because there were there were no dog tags in those days. There were right. no graves registration units. Well, maybe like they would sew something inside their coats, something that, like that. At most, at most, and yeah, if that wasn't most. there, they really had no way. And that of often it. came later as well in the war. Yeah, yeah. Um, you look at that, 
and you wonder how many homes. How many homes were destroyed along with the lives there? You, you think of how much in the life of, of one household after another, candles and lamps are put out in the darkness not knowing, never in fact hearing hmm. whatever might have happened to a brother, a son, a father, an uncle. And you total up the sum of that agony. And sometimes it can almost be too much to think about. Yeah. And yet you reflect on the fact that this sacrifice was made consciously, it was made deliberately. We have to do this. In the years after the war, there were veterans units which paid periodic visits to Gettysburg. And I remember reading in one regimental history that I have up on the shelves here behind me, a New Jersey artillery battery. Its veterans met at Gettysburg along with members of the families. And on one occasion, the father of a boy who had been killed at Gettysburg broke down crying. He said, my boy, my boy, he was all I had. And one of the veterans took him by the elbow, pointed him to the flag at the center of, of the cemetery and said, as long as that flag waves, your boy's life will be remembered and he will not have died in vain. Hmm. And there, there is within the pain of that also a consolation. The extraordinary sacrifice, but the extraordinary power that met and triumphed there. And then I suppose probably in the biggest context, what continues to fascinate in the war is how it contradicted everyone's expectations. <laughs> you have to think, Colin, that in the middle of the 19th century, the United States is the only still surviving, freestanding, large-scale democracy in the world. All these other experiments, you know, the French Revolution, the Bolivarian republics in South America, all had wandered off either into failure or dictatorship or whatever. And in, in terms of a successful large-scale democracy, it was only the United States. Every emperor and king and duke and dictator was sitting around watching and waiting for something to point the finger at and say, see, they're going to fail. They, they, it can't succeed. Human beings were born with bits in their mouths and bridles in their mouths and saddles on their backs waiting to be mm -hmm. ridden by us aristocrats who really know how to make things operate. And when the Civil War breaks out, it, they rejoice. They think, yeah. gee, this is the end of the American democracy. And of course, it didn't happen that way. It turned out entirely different. It was the friends of democracy in England and in France who rejoiced. It was, it was slaves in, sp in the sugar fields of of Spanish Cuba, who intermingled with their songs these, these words, Avanza Lincoln, Avanza, tu espe esperanza, advance Lincoln, advance, you are our hope. It was a message that not only said that the American democracy would survive, but that democracy itself had proven its durability and would go on from there, ever moving upwards. That, I think, taken together, gives us the source of the fascination the Civil War exerts for all of us even today. I will often tell people that um, no one dislikes history. They just haven't heard it taught by Dr. Alan Gelzo oh. yet. <laughs> I mean, how could you not be fascinated how can how can you not be fascinated? There's endless stories, endless characters, endless drama in history. But does not that confirm what we find in Psalm 77? I have considered the days of old, the tale of ancient years. Of course, because that is what we look back upon even in the context of the Bible. How, how, do the, how do the people of God identify themselves? My father was a wandering Aramean. 
what, what, does, what does the apostle say in 1 Corinthians? We, we have all come through the Red Sea. We have all come through the cloud. Constantly the reference is to a historical reality. There is a, there is a strength there. And it's a strength that emerges as we see it in the biblical narrative. It is a strength that emerges as we consult our own national and historical narrative. Because it tells us that this thing, democracy, is what Lincoln said, the most natural, the most automatic way. It is, it is you might say, it's the default position of human nature and human governance for everyone. This is, this is why I am not sympathetic to people who like to identify themselves as nationalists. It's not because I, I don't love my own country, I do. But I remember how Lincoln talked about love of country. In an oration that he gave as a eulogy for Henry Clay, he asked the question, why? And Henry Clay, he said, was his beau ideal of a statesman. Mm -hmm. Lincoln, Lincoln said, Clay loved his country. First of all, because it was his country, and that's a natural impulse. But even in a more larger sense, Lincoln said, Clay loved his country because it showed that free men could be prosperous. In other words, that democracy is not a self-defeating arrangement. So when we say that we love what the American experiment is, what we are saying is we are loving something that addresses the fundamental needs and realities of human beings in the most general sense of the word. It's not just the expression of something peculiar to the American landscape or, the, or, or, or to the, to, even to the American experience itself. But rather, what Americans have helped to realize is what Jefferson describes in the Declaration as something that is common to every human being, and that is those natural rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if the Civil War is the story of justifying anything, it is the story of justifying those things. Many listeners, viewers, they may be aware at the highest level of academic circles among conservatives, some of the debates, you alluded to that there, national conservatives, another iteration, integralists. Just explain what you mean by calling national conservatives and integralists the mirror image of progressives. Progressives believe that we are the products of historical accidents, that there are no really funda fundamental continuities in the human experience. We are all simply the products of responses to our environment and the struggle for survival within that environment. And no one environment is really superior to another. So the answer that one group of people or one tribe or clan or race or nation comes up with has no necessary truth to it. It's simply a response to that particular environment. And you try to cope with that environment as the environment dictates. Ironically, national conservatives don't say anything that's really terribly different from that. They say we should not confine ourselves to try to discover universal principles of human behavior. We are all the products of a particular culture, of a particular language, of a particular ethnicity, even of a particular religious formation. And if, uh, if that is the case, then what we should do is we should cultivate our own gardens, and we should let those particular things rule in our life, and we'll let others have their rule, and we won't disturb them. But we'll concentrate on doing our own and making our own way of doing things uniform. Each of those points of view has something, some element in it, which sounds or feels persuasive. And yet I think both are wrong. I think in the case of the integralist, and the integralists are people, and I, I won't drop names, but the integralists are people who are overwhelmingly be, believe, in, in their, their belief is that you need a religious system to inform your culture, and the religious system that they would prefer to have is one of a particular religious denomination. If I could be confident that religious people, as religious people, are always right and good and judge correctly, I could be an integralist. But I know better because I know that religious people are people 
I know that they make mistakes, sometimes hideous mistakes. And I am leery about putting the kind of power into their hands that their integralism would ask for. Likewise, the American experiment began with an idea about the nation, an idea about its government, an idea about democracy, and built its culture around that idea, not the other way around. We didn't start out with a culture and then build a democracy. No, we started out with the ideas, the ideas captured in the Declaration, the ideas formulated in the Constitution, and we developed a culture from that so that the two interact together, yes, but the priority is in the ideas of the formation. So I do have my difficulties, and I have been asked from time to time, are you a national conservative? And I have to say, frankly, no. I am a Lincolnian. And I look at the example of Lincoln, and I see in this man virtues of political life that I have to say I think are admirable. I see in him resiliency. I see in him humility. I see in him a determination to know and understand people and situations. I see in him large elements of compassion, yet compassion combined with a determination to do what is right. Above all, I see a recognition of natural law and natural rights. I think I am content with the democracy that Lincoln saved, and I would like to see that democracy continue on the Lincolnian principles. Does it involve risks? Yes. Will it make mistakes? You betcha, as I hear some of my relatives say to me. <laughs> yeah, it'll do all those things. It'll also do tremendously good things. And where it has made mistakes, it will correct those mistakes. Lincoln said, don't expect, don't expect perfection today from democracy. Rather, he said, Reflect on what is written in the Gospels. Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Not, Lincoln said, not, not that anyone claims to be perfect now, but that we have an aspiration that will guide us and motivate us towards doing it better and better, correcting what is wrong, improving on what is right. I'm going to make my students here at Beeson Divinity School listen to this podcast to help them understand why I Teach Abraham Lincoln in a Course Designed to Train Pastors for Ministry, specifically looking through the Second Inaugural Address, which I put with Letter from Birmingham Jail as the two greatest works of public theology in American history. Now, you write that Lincoln's command of the Bible was a ready reference concordance. <laughs> yes. I mean, no one, no one matches King, certainly not in presidential rhetoric, um, in terms of his biblical references, which you need to know your King James Bible to be able to know, <laughs> you know, yes. to recognize all those references. And yet, this was fascinating. And everything else I've read from you and many others on Lincoln, it did not occur to me that you found only one serious Christian book he ever read. And that's only because he was friends with the author. So I know you've written extensively on this, but in a brief answer, how did Christianity shape Lincoln? I think it shaped it through some general matters of natural revelation. I mean, the New Testament talks about, and the Old Testament as well, talks about how the heavens declare the glory of God. In the New Testament, we read about how God has made himself known to all the nations. Now, they have sometimes denied that and sometimes covered it up and sometimes blinded themselves. But yet, nevertheless, God has revealed himself in a variety of ways. Lincoln understood that kind of revelation. He did not embrace a particular revelation, the authority of the Bible for himself personally. He recognized that it was authority, an authority in his time, and so he will, in fact, quote it. And he finds it congenial to read. But he doesn't read it in the sense that a believer will read the Bible. He will read it as a good book. He will read it as he read Shakespeare. Shakespeare as, as say, something yeah. that will teach him important lessons. Right. And yet, it is still the Bible that he comes back to and asks people to reflect upon. And in the second inaugural, he will deploy the Bible as a way of rebutting his critics. Because you know what he, what he says in the second inaugural is not a compliment. 
He says, this, this war came upon us. Why? Because of slavery. And it has exacted a cost from both North and South. Why? The North were the good guys, weren't they? No, he says, no. We have both been implicated in it. Both profits. And at that, at that point, you can almost hear people saying, wait a minute, no, 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 no. We, we're not implicated, not us. And Lincoln says, if you want to protest that, you need to argue with a higher authority. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And it is on that basis that he's able to turn and say, this is why we have malice toward none and charity for all. Because in a sense, we all have sinned this way. We all need forgiveness. And none of us can sit in judgment on each other. Yeah, that, that's... I think the the person who gave me the best context for understanding that was probably Harry Stouts upon the altar of the nation, moral history of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't grasp, because of the way that we view Lincoln in American history so exalted, I did not grasp how unique Lincoln was in his time, how magnanimous he was. Mm -hmm. And we there's no reason to take that for granted because of all people, he would presumably have been the one to we would expect to be the least why magnanimous. Shouldn't, why shouldn't he have converted the second inaugural into a victory lap? Would anyone have blamed him if he did? No. No. If anything, he knew he was flying in the face of a lot of opinion by saying, no, 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 we have to have malice toward none, charity for all. But he does that. He does it because he understands two things. He understands that judgment belongs to God. Not, not in our hands. Ultimately speaking, judgment belongs to God. And God is a judge of us all, and God judges by different rules than the ones we invent for ourselves. And it's not our, it's not, it's not in our gift to, to contradict, to criticize those rules, even if we do not entirely understand those rules. In fact, the very fact that we don't understand them means that we need to submit to them. And he knew that he would come into, into criticism this way, which, it, which he did. But the other thing that moves in this way is because he understands something about democracy. And that is that vengeance is toxic. Yeah. Toxic because the exercise of vengeance is very close to the exercise of power. You see, you, one, of, one of the great things that the American founders understood, and it's reflected in the Constitution itself, is that there are two great forces in politics. You might say it's like the strong force and the weak force in physics. There's liberty and there's power. If you have liberty and only liberty, it will become license, it will become anarchy. And anarchy will only bring in despotism as a, as a cure. But power, power, power helps you keep the lights on. Power helps to keep things in a regulated fashion, but the use of power has to be very sharply circumscribed because power is toxic. Power poisons what it touches. It's like polonium. You can get a nuclear reaction out of it, but you can also be poisoned by it. So the founders worked very hard to maximize liberty and to minimize power, but not to eliminate power because you have to have some power. Something has to restrain liberty from becoming license. Balancing those two, those two forces is one of the genius creations of, of the American founders. Lincoln understood that. And because he understood that vengeance is such near kin to power, he understood it could poison every aspect of the victory that had been won in the Civil War. So he asks us to do something that we almost feel is unnatural, and that is to back off. Power, if I can draw the analogy to Tolkien and the Fellowship yeah. of the Ring, yeah. power is captured in that ring of power. Power is something that distorts, power corrupts, power makes people into something less than human. And you see that in all these characters that Tolkien creates. That's a fundamental piece of wisdom that Tolkien captures. And I think it's also, in its own way, politically speaking, the, something the founders captured and which Lincoln realized. 
Well, let me expand on that illustration. We don't know exactly how Lincoln would have wielded power. I mean, at that point in time, I, I think it would be safe to, when he died, I, I think it would be safe to say that he was the most powerful military and political leader the world had ever seen at that time. I mean, maybe not in the full swath of a, of a Caesar in terms of territory, but certainly in terms of the military might and the size of the army and things like that. We don't know exactly how that would have gone throughout a second term and then who knows whatever after that. But it seems as though the second inaugural gives us the best glimpse of that. Even, be, even before the second inaugural, you see how cautious he is. He issues the Emancipation Proclamation on the 1st of January, 1863. And the Emancipation Proclamation is a dramatic document, Colin. Uh, it is the most dramatic exercise of power by an American president up to that time. He is emancipating over three million slaves at one stroke of his pen. Mm. Now he's doing it with some circumscriptions. Uh, for one thing, the uh, Emancipation Proclamation only emancipates slaves in the rebellious Confederacy, right. not the slaves in the four border states not that remain states. loyal to the Union. Right. He exempts them. He exempts some of the areas of the South that have been occupied by federal forces. And people ever since have scratched their, their heads and thought, why, why does he exempt those areas? Why doesn't he just abolish slavery completely by presidential diktat? Well, his basic answer would look like this. My authority for issuing this Emancipation Proclamation grows entirely out of one provision in the Constitution, that the president shall be commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy in time of, of actual, of actual uh, war or rebellion. He is emancipating those slaves as a war measure. It's not because he didn't think that slavery was wrong. He just didn't have any constitutional authority to do more than that. He respects that authority. And then, this is the really striking thing. On September 2nd, 1863, he responds to a letter from his Secretary of the Treasury, Salmon Chase. Chase was, a, Chase was an old-time card-carrying abolitionist. When he had been governor and, and, uh, and senator from Ohio, they referred to him as the attorney general for fugitive slaves. Chase writes to Lincoln and urges Lincoln. He's now nine months since the promulgation of the Emancipation Proclamation. Expand it. Free the slaves everywhere. Lincoln writes back to him and says, I can't do that. That would be my personal inclination, but I can't just put my personal inclination in the saddle here. I don't have the constitutional authority to do that. And if I tried to do it, he says, would I not be in the boundless field of absolutism? Hmm. Lincoln understands the poisonous nature of power. He would be, as he would say in another context, he would be effectively giving away the whole issue of the war to the Confederacy. Because what was the Confederacy built upon? Yeah. The Confederacy was built upon assertions of power. The power of white people over black people. The power of state governments to trump the authority of the rest of the American people. That, those kinds of inversions of relationships were based upon the seizure of power. And Lincoln is saying, do you really want me to do the same thing now? Do you want me to yield to that same temptation? Do you want me to put the ring of power on too? And so his response to Chase is, no, I can't do that. I have to operate within the boundaries of the Constitution and the laws. That's why, that's why he will put his shoulder to the wheel for a constitutional amendment in 1865 to abolish slavery. Because that's the way to do it, constitutionally, not by the diktat of the president, as well-intentioned as that diktat might be. And Chase, as a result, in part of that, then explores running for president against Lincoln in the Republican primary because of his frustration. Lincoln knows this, but Lincoln keeps him in his cabinet as Treasury Secretary because he's so excellent at his job, yeah. and that eventually Chase, unsuccessful in running against Lincoln, ends up with the courts, correct? He... Um Chase, Chase, Chase took it one step too far yeah, sure later on. I mean, he, 
he dared Lincoln one too many times. And he did. He's always submitting his resignation if he's not getting his way. And finally, Lincoln said, all right, fine. Finally our, took it. <laughs> our, our relationships have finally reached a point of mutual embarrassment. I'm going to accept your, your letter. It's not to say that I'm undoing or unsaying any of the good things I've said about you or any of the good things you've done, but it's over. And then he appoints Chase as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Of the Supreme Court. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, some people have said, well, that, that really effectively ended Chase's presidential ambitions by kicking him upstairs. The truth is, no, it didn't. Chase kept thinking about himself for president. In 1872, he really coveted the possibility of the liberal Republicans nominating him for the presidency. But Chase was an, Chase was an interesting man in many ways, a man of of great integrity, uh, a, a very sincere religious person. And yet at the same time, as Lincoln once said about him, his principal, his principal misapprehension was that he believed that there was a fourth person in the Trinity. <laughs> and, and the point that we're trying to make here is, is how Lincoln is the exception He's the one with the power, and yet he is the exception who does not use it yeah. and wield it in those ways, in part which is what allows the American experiment that he treasured so much to be able to continue. And there are any number of lessons that can be learned from that in an era when the Internet gives us so much more, it gives government so much more power um, than they had before, as you can see in China and elsewhere. He is, he's, he's the opposite of the mad scientist in the laboratory. He's the opposite of the Dr. Frankenstein who uses power to make a nightmare. He's more in that respect like, like Thomas Alva Edison. When Edison created the first prototype of his electric light bulb, he handed the bulb to an associate who dropped it. <laughs> And Edison went back and worked up another prototype, and the first thing he did was to hand it to the same associate. Yeah, the same person, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know I've been waiting for this opportunity for many years. Um, back in the books and culture days, Dr. Gelzo, I reviewed your book on Gettysburg. Oh, and, right. um, and again, have been a voracious reader of, of whatever you write. But um, for people who are just you know, learning and seeing Dr. Gelzo's work now, then you can know that he's just as good as a writer as he is as a teacher and an interview uh, guest, which is exceptionally good. So you can pick up his latest, Our Ancient Faith, Lincoln, Democracy, and the American Experiment. Last question, what's next? What are you writing? What's, what's going to be next from you? Well, there are a number of things. <laughs> uh, I have uh, under construction almost ready to go uh, into the bookstores, a new Gettysburg book that is called Voices from Gettysburg. Okay. And it's an anthology. It's an anthology okay. of primary source materials on Gettysburg and the Gettysburg campaign. Uh, the, kind of, the kind of book that will let you read the original voices of people right. at that time. Sometimes it's from published memoirs. Sometimes there are a number of primary manuscript uh, sources that are appearing in print for the very first time. But this anthology will be released uh, officially from Kensington Press on May 21st. So that's something that's coming along. Um, my, my old lifelong friend, James Hankins of uh, Harvard, and I are collaborating in writing a new two-volume history of Western civilization to be called The Golden Thread. And we're, we're cracking on every square inch of sail to uh, to get that into port by the end of, the, by the end of this year, I'm working right now on a single volume collection of the political writings of Abraham Lincoln oh, yeah. for yeah. Cambridge University Press. I'm also going to be committed to writing a new history of the Battle of Antietam and the okay. Antietam campa campaign, mm. and then beyond that, there is uh, there's a publisher. And one of uh, one of that publisher's principal editors, who is working very hard to get me to sign a contract for a book on history and theory. Okay. So, 
Perhaps at some point I just should say no. Do you think? I mean, would that would that? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be the one to encourage you to say I, no. If I can just read you as fast as you can write, then I'll be in good shape. Well, I sometimes say that I'm a little bit like the character in the musical Oklahoma, the one who can't say no. <laughs> I don't know whether that's good or bad, but it does. Uh, it does. It does keep me you know, from wandering around at night. <laughs> well, God's in that work, Dr. Gelzo. Again, check out his newest book, Our Ancient Faith, Lincoln Democracy and the American Experiment. What a delightful hour. Thanks, Dr. Gelzo. All right. Thank you, Colin.